Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, we're so glad you all could join us today. Uh, my name is Laura Jenkins. I'm a genetic counselor here at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. And uh, I'm going to be joined eventually by two of my colleagues, um, Emily Lancaster and Ashley Lahr. They're both genetic counselors here as well. Um, given COVID and wearing masks, we're going to sort of take turns. Um, so hopefully you can hear us better without masks on. Um, after the presentation, we're all three going to be in the room uh, and we can do a question and answer session. So, um, so again, welcome. And um, the point of today's uh, sort of presentation is to talk about genetic counseling, uh, what it is and how you can do it. Um, so talking about in general what it means to be a genetic counselor, uh, what the field is all about, and what it takes to become a genetic counselor. All right. Um, Sorry, let me get to my, there we go. Okay, so the first question really is, what is a genetic counselor and what do we do? Um, so genetic counselors are professional, healthcare professionals. Um, we have advanced training in genetics and counseling, and we basically guide patients through the genetic testing process. Um, genetic counselors have a master's degree uh, from an accredited program. Um, so there are sort of a limited number of programs um, in the United States and Canada as well, actually. Um, that offer the program. Uh, and I think Emily is gonna actually talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then genetic counselors are also uh, board certified and we're certified by the American Board of Genetic Counselors. Um, so that involves taking a really long test in order to be board certified. So, so in thinking about, you know, what is the exact role of the genetic counselor in the healthcare profession? Um, so we do multiple things. Uh, the primary um, sort of job that we have is just basically helping patients understand the genetic testing process, genetic risk evaluation, uh, and what that means for them specifically. Um, so we help patients understand their genetic risks based on their family history. Uh, we work with the patients and the doctors. So genetic counselors typically work with a geneticist uh, or some other uh, MD or DO um, who has an interest in genetics. Typically, they are geneticists, but sometimes other um, professions as well um, work with genetic counselors. Um, and we work with the doctors and the patients to develop sort of specific um, personalized medical plans, depending on sort of what the particular issue is in their family. I think most importantly, our job is to enable patients and families to make informed decisions about the genetic testing process. So are, do they want genetic testing? Um, one of our, the genetic counselor mottos is, no one has to have genetic testing. Genetic testing should always be a personal choice um, for the family and or the patient, um, depending on the, the, the patient's age. Um, and so our job is to help walk them through that whole process and, you know, keeping in mind their personal values, um, their cultural values, and, uh, you know, what they're hoping to get out of the whole process and helping them come to a decision that makes sense for them, um, as opposed to just kind of what they're being told to do. Um, we also, uh, if genetic testing is pursued and results come back, a big part of our job is talking about those results with the family. Um, we typically review those results with a physician or whoever we're working with. And then the genetic counselor is the one who typically um, discloses those results to the family and walks them through, you know, what do these results mean? Um, and then I think it's important too to recognize that that results discussion is not only just for positive test results where we have a diagnosis, um, but also results that can come back either inconclusive or uncertain or even negative test results. You know, what does a negative test result mean um, for the patient or the family? Um, we help the patients process all this medical information that we're throwing at them and also the emotional implications of genetic test results and the whole genetic testing process. Um, we, you know, also if for instance, a diagnosis is made for a patient. Part of our job is also to help almost acclimate the family or the patient to that diagnosis. And one of the ways we can do that is connecting them to resources, support groups, even connecting them with other families who have similar diagnoses, 
Um, and, you know, just anything we can do to support the family as they go through this genetics journey. Um, there's also a lot of behind the scenes work, so it's not just seeing the patient. Um, there's a lot of preparation that goes into seeing a patient beforehand. Um, we spend a lot of time, um, I think somewhat different from other specialties. Um, we do review a patient's entire chart before they come to see us. Um, it's important for genetics that we consider everything about the patient, um, not just say, you know, if you're going to see cardiology, they're sort of more interested in the heart, or if you're going to neurology, they're interested in the brain. For genetics, we have to consider every single sort of body system and health issue, and that requires a really deep dive into the patient chart. So um, that can be quite time consuming, um, and there's a lot of prep ahead of time. Um, we also do work on the back end for things like insurance authorization of testing, letters of medical necessity, if that's something that's required for insurance authorization of the test, um, obtaining records from um, other specialists or the PCP, things like that. Um, so there's a lot of work. So every patient, if we spend, you know, an hour or an hour and a half with them in person, there's several hours of additional work that go into seeing that patient and providing patient care, both before the, before the visit and after the visit as well. Um, so the exciting thing about genetic counseling, I think, is how much the field is growing. Um, I'm one of the older or old timers here. I graduated in 1995 with my master's. Um, and so really the field looks so much different from 1995. Um, to 2020. So uh, we now have over 5,000 certified genetic counselors. Um, so that is really like an exponential growth in terms of how many genetic counselors are out there. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed um, since 1995 is that people understand much more what a genetic counselor is and what we bring to patient care. Um, whereas back in 1995, I still got, you know, Every, virtually everybody said like, well, what is a genetic counselor and what do you do? And, um, and now, particularly even in the, within the medical field, um, you know, other specialists will say, oh, great, there's a genetic counselor involved because um, they see sort of the value of what we bring to the, whole, the table in terms of patient care. So, so it's really exciting and it's just continuing to grow as a profession. So um, there's a number of different ways that um, genetic counselors here in Pittsburgh and sort of all over the country are involved with both direct and indirect patient care. So at Children's, again, just like sort of in, in the nation, we've exponentially grown uh, in terms of how many genetic counselors there are that are here, um, where we are involved in patient care within the hospital. Um, we have over 20 genetic counselors here at Children's. Um, and on staff at UPMC, um, and we're in multiple divisions. So we're not just present in, you know, the division of medical genetics, but we're, we have a presence in other divisions as well. Um, in addition, Children's Hospital here in Pittsburgh is a rotation site for the master's program at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and so we do have students rotate with us, um, and they're part of the learning process here. Um, so basically, think of it like a residency uh, for genetic counselors. Um, so we always enjoy working with the students here, and they get to see lots of really interesting things, and they get a lot of great exposure to the pediatric world, um, certainly here at Children's. So, and then we also have genetic counselors who are involved more on the clin or the research end, um, things with clinical trials, um, research studies, things like that. So that is always um, an opportunity for genetic counselors as well. Sorry, wrong way. All right, so as I talked about, we have about 20 genetic counselors um, throughout UPMC and Children's, uh, probably really just at Children's, UPMC, there's more. Um, so the majority of the genetic counselors work in the Division of Medical Genetics, um, but there are also genetic counselors who work specifically in the Department of Hematology Oncology, um, in the Pulmonary Department, um, Neurology, the neurodevelopmental rare diseases clinic uh, and cardiology as well so um, you know that is really a great sort of outreach and a, and a great example of how genetic counselors are really expanding their role um, just in patient care in general and throughout the you know the medical system 
Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that and, and Emily as well in terms of how our genetic counselors are really interfacing with those other specialties as well. Um, so, so one of the questions we get is, well, who do you see and how does someone get to see you? How, do you, how, do, how does someone get to genetics of children's? Um, so a lot of our referrals are from primary care physicians um, as well as other specialties, even within children's or outside of children's. Um, and then again, as we had talked about, um, we have genetic counselors who um, work in the what's called genetic testing clinic, um, and they facilitate the genetic counseling process um, for patients that are being referred often directly from another specialist. So say, you know, a neurologist for a patient who has seizures, and so it's a very specific test that they're interested in, and so they will be seen by a genetic counselor in the genetic testing clinic. Um, and they provide, you know, full genetic counseling services, um, but it's a little bit more of an immediate, like in real time, uh, genetic counseling. All right. So some of the indications for things um, that you know someone might be referred to genetics for um, would be fragile X syndrome. Uh, fragile X is a neurodevelopmental condition that is caused by a specific change in a gene carried on the X chromosome. Um, as many of you are probably aware from basic biology, females have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y. Um, so fragile X, given that it's caused by a gene on the X chromosome, tends to be seen more in males uh, and is the, the number one sort of genetic cause of uh, developmental issues, intellectual disability in male children. Um, we often get referrals for uh, things called connective tissue disorders. One example that people are often aware of is something called Marfan syndrome. Um, and you know, just really anything, we see patients who have concern for osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, also, sometimes people refer to it colloquially as uh, brittle bone disease. Um, we see kids who have autism, who have seizure disorders, who have craniosynostosis, which is early fusing of the plates in the skull. Um, so there are just a, there's a whole host of, of reasons that we see individuals. Um, typically, even if a child say, you know, I don't say just, but if their only diagnosis is autism, we often will see those individuals as well. So um, there is a, a significant proportion of autism that has some sort of underlying genetic um, sort of reason or predisposition. So we often see kids with autism. Um, poor growth is another uh, indication that we can see kids for. So kids that are, you know, shorter than expected based on their mid-parental heights or uh, individuals who aren't um, gaining weight appropriately. Um, we, you know, are often called in to try and find an underlying genetic reason for that poor growth. And then, um, you know, of course, another main reason is something we call multiple congenital anomalies. Um, so individuals, children typically here, who have more than one thing going on. So not autism alone, but say autism and a congenital heart defect, or very tall stature and an unusual skeletal uh, abnormality, uh, things like that. So whenever there's sort of more than one thing going on that don't necessarily seem to go together, um, that's oftentimes when genetics gets called in to try and determine could there be one underlying genetic condition that is contributing to all of these seemingly unrelated things? Um, we also, interestingly, um, sometimes see individuals who have more than one genetic condition. So we may get referrals from you know, individuals who have a genetic diagnosis, but it doesn't seem to answer the question as to why they have all of the different sort of health or development issues that they have. So while it seems on the surface that so we have a diagnosis for that child, we often then get to see that child again and say, mm, this doesn't seem to be quite the full answer. And there are individuals who have more than one genetic diagnosis. So sometimes, you know, the, the genetic testing process is, an, is a journey. Uh, sometimes we call it the genetic testing odyssey um, because it can be, you know, it's not just sort of a one and done visit, um, but it can be multiple visits and, and really sort of an investigative process. Um, the other reason that we see patients quite often is because there's a family history of a genetic disorder. Um, so if there's a known family history, um, 
of say, you know, a cardiomyopathy condition. So a condition that affects the heart um, and causes it to, you know, basically be overgrown, um, then that can be something that would have major implications for other family members. And, you know, we can facilitate that genetic testing process, notifying other family members, helping our patient disseminate that information to other family members, um, and facilitating testing if they're interested, uh, et cetera. So, so that's an another main reason why we get referrals. Um, so I had mentioned before, you know, we typically see patients, it's a long visit. Uh, patients are warned to bring lots of diapers and food and be prepared to be here for a couple of hours, a couple of hours for the genetics visit. Um, typically here at Children's, the way we have it set up is that the patient and the family see the genetic counselor first. Um, the genetic counselor has prepped the chart ahead of time, so we typically have an idea as to why the patient's coming in, but not always. Sometimes we're going in blind, we haven't gotten any records, um, and we basically do an intake. So we talk to the family about, um, you know, the child's medical history and specialists that they've seen. We take a complete pregnancy history social history, developmental history, so a lot of intake, review of systems, kind of going through all the body systems and parts and saying, you know, how's Johnny doing with his growth, with his eyes, with his hearing, all that kind of stuff. We also talk to the family at that point, just in general about sort of what are their motivations for genetic, for having a genetics visit, what is their expectation of what genetic testing, you know, might tell them, um, you know, really just kind of getting a sense of, of what they're here for because then that can help us guide them in terms of, you know, how we can maybe answer some of the questions they have, or, you know, do they have unrealistic expectations and we have to sort of back that down a little bit and say, well, here's what we may be able to help you with. Um, here's what we likely can't specifically tell you, but, um, you know, just to give them a, a realistic understanding of, of what genetics is all about. After that, we take a couple minutes to review everything that we have uh, obtained from the family, and then we review it with the medical geneticist. And then at that point, the medical geneticist goes in with the family um, to do the physical exam and come up with sort of a testing algorithm or a plan for that patient. Um, and then um, we're starting with the next patient at that point. And then anything that occurs after the visit, so again, insurance authorization, talking with the family further about what their decision might be, um, that all is the genetic, back to the genetic counselor. Um, so, you know, in addition to genetic testing, a genetics evaluation can include a lot of other sort of um, data collection. So oftentimes the geneticist will recommend imaging studies, so be it an echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart or a skeletal survey where they take x-rays from head to toe to look for skeletal, skeletal anomalies. Um, other blood tests, screening for some genetic disorders, things like that. There's there's often a lot of other um, sort of recommendations, not just and only genetic testing that can help um, with making a diagnosis. Um, we've mentioned a lot about insurance authorization, and the reason we have to do that is genetic testing typically is quite expensive. And so typically for the majority of genetic tests that we recommend, we do have to get insurance authorization for that testing before the patient has their blood drawn or gives a cheek swab or whatever tissue we're testing. Um, typically that's blood. And so that is um, the genetic or the genetic counselor uh, sort of initiates that authorization process. We're really lucky here at Children's that we have um, authorization, insurance authorization spe specialists that work with us. And so they're a huge help in terms of reducing some of that um, task from us, but um, we do sort of initiate that process. Um, it can take several months to get insurance authorization. So one of the roles of the genetic counselor is to warn the family that, you know, nothing in genetics typically happens quickly, um, that it's a process. It can take us a couple months to get insurance authorization. Once we do and the sample gets to the lab, it can still be another, you know, anywhere from four weeks to four months to get a result back. Um, then we interpret the results and then we contact the family. So it's definitely a process. Um, and that is part of the genetic counseling that we give to families. You know, again, managing their expectations as to, you know, how is this gonna work? When will I get an answer? What is that answer maybe gonna be? 
Um, and once we get results, you know, it's important, you know, we don't just look at the lab's interpretation and say, okay, that's, I'm calling the family. So, you know, we look at the lab interpretation with the geneticist, say, does this make sense? Do we understand it? How are we gonna explain this to the family? What does this mean for the family? What are recommendations from here on out? So given, say, a diagnosis, what do we now recommend for the family? Do they need to have kidney screening every three months till they're eight years old? Or do they need to be followed by cardiology now? Or, you know, just follow up in a year? Um, so that is also a big part of what we provide for the families. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Um, and she's going to come in and finish the rest of the presentation. And then, as I said, once Emily's done, uh, myself and then Ashley Lahr, another one of our colleagues, uh, will come back in the room um, and we will answer any questions that you have. Okay, thanks so much. All right. Hi, so my name is Emily. I'm going to be telling you about some of the individual specialties here at the Department of Medical Genetics, as well as the Genetic Testing Clinic, kind of all the different hats that we wear here at Children's and the different ways we get involved. So this is just a picture of all of us in the Department of Medical Genetics. So you can see there's quite a few of us just within the MedGen department. There's going to be more within the Genetic Testing Clinic later that I'll show, as well as our ophthalmology genetic counselors. And so, in addition to kind of our general pediatrics clinic, I'm going to focus on some of the more specialty clinics. So, starting off with the lysosomal storage disorders clinic. This is one that is meant for patients and family members who have a history of a lysosomal storage disorder. And so, at this clinic, they'll discuss with families testing, future risk for the disorder to come up in other family members, future pregnancies, things like that a diagnosis if that's applicable to the family, education about the conditions, potential research studies that are available, as well as financial resources for the family, treatment options. A lot of lysosomal storage disorders can have potential treatment options, as well as long-term management, what to expect moving forward for a family, and newborn screening. So these are some of the conditions that are included on the newborn screen, which is that heel prick that happens about 24 hours after baby is born that screens them for conditions that have treatments available. There are over 60 different conditions that are related to the enzymes in our lysosome. So we listed a few here, some of the more common ones that we'll see, Gauche, Fabre, Pompeii, MPS, Tay-Sachs, Neiman Pick. Some of these do have FDA approved treatments available. So as we said, if there is a treatment option, that's something that we can educate the family about and help walk them through that process. On a somewhat related note, we also have an Inherited Disorders of Metabolism clinic. So this is a multidisciplinary clinic that includes a nurse, a dietitian, social work, a doctor in genetic, geneticist, and then genetic counselors. So the disorders of metabolism are going to be things that have to do with how you metabolize, as it's implied in the name. And so that's why we have dietitians involved. A lot of these can be managed through diet or other types of treatments. As I said earlier, these are some of the conditions that are also picked up on the newborn screen, or it can be picked up on lab work that maybe your pediatrician might order for a patient, or if there's a family history of someone with a metabolic condition. So we will see individuals who already have an established diagnosis in this clinic, or individuals who qualify for trials or different treatments for these specific conditions. We also have a dedicated inpatient team of genetic counselors here. So this is meant for children who are admitted to the hospital. And while they are here, there is a concern that they may have a genetic condition. And so we have two dedicated inpatient genetic counselors that will go through and talk to these families while they're in the hospital, as opposed to the outpatient appointments that we schedule. So oftentimes our inpatient genetic counselors see patients who have congenital anomalies, any possible inborn errors in metabolism. We'll see newborns, so if someone's been just been born, they may not have time to develop medical concerns that may indicate a diagnosis, but they may have abnormal blood work that came back soon following birth. Or if there's a family history of a genetic disorder, maybe they haven't had a chance to see genetics, but it comes up while they're inpatient that there's a family history, our genetic counselors will get involved as well. 
As I said, we have two dedicated inpatient genetic counselors. So they help the physicians to review the benefits and limitations of testing with the patients and then provide genetic counseling services for the patients and families. We also have a pediatric cardiovascular genetics clinic. So this is one of the newer ones that we've had here at Children's. This was started in 2018. And this is meant more for people who have a family history of an inherited cardiac condition, or maybe a child who was diagnosed with a certain cardiac condition that could have an underlying genetic diagnosis. So things like cardiomyopathy, issues with heart rhythm, you know, dilatation of the aorta, things of that nature. These appointments are available based on indication and if genetic testing has already taken place in the family or not. So depending on the situation, sometimes we see individuals who have a family history, but maybe for whatever reason, other family members haven't been able to be tested for a genetic condition yet. Ideally, we like to test an individual who has features first, especially for cardiac conditions, where somebody who's had a history of cardiomyopathy, that's gonna be more informative testing than someone who's at risk for it. So depending on the situation, they may see a cardiologist and a genetic counselor, or they may see just our genetic counselor. We also have an outreach community to the outreach clinic for the Plain communities. So this is for population of our local Amish and Mennonite families in Western Pennsylvania. And this offers primary and specialty care to this population across eight different states. So it's part of the Plain Communities Consortium of Clinics. And this can include a lot of different specialties as well. So medical genetics, genetic counselors, neurology can get involved, nutrition support, and then additional services as needed by the family. A big part of this is also for research initiatives. So trying to provide them access to free and reduced cost genetic testing, as oftentimes Amish and Mennonite families might not have a formal type of health insurance. And so trying to come up with something that's still financially feasible for these families to get genetic testing services. We also have a sickle cell clinic here at the hospital. That's actually what I'm involved in. And so this is through the hematology department for individuals with sickle cell disease, either SS or SC. And so we will also see patients who have sickle cell trait. So they are a carrier for sickle cell, but don't actually have a diagnosis, but they could have the potential to have children with sickle cell depending on their partner status. So I'll meet with families to talk about the diagnosis and recurrence risk. This clinic, because it's through hematology, also meets with physicians. There's nurse specialties, there's social workers and behavioral health specialists who can help meet with the families. And so that's something that, depending on the age, determines how often they're seen in the clinic. I usually get involved from birth to about three years old to talk to the family about the diagnosis, chances of this happening in future pregnancies for the parents. And then I'll meet again with patients when they're between the ages of 16 and 21, as they're starting to get to the age to take charge of their medical care and ask questions to talk with them about their chances of having a child with sickle cell disease. We also have a pediatric cancer predisposition clinic. So UPMC does have an outside adult cancer clinic, but there are some types of childhood cancers that can come up that have a genetic cause. And so this is coordinated with the HEMOC clinic here at Children's, and we'll see patients for a variety of reasons. So cancers that come up under the age of 20, this is usually for certain types of tumors and cancers. Not every type has a genetic basis. If there are things that are multifocal or bilateral cancer or multiple primary tumors, that can be more indicative of a genetic cause. If it's an adult form of cancer that's occurring at an age earlier than expected, a child with cancer, and then also a history of other concerns, as Laura talked about earlier, things like developmental delays, autism, any other birth defects or dysmorphic facial features, which are kind of atypical facial features that we can see, that tends to indicate that it's a genetic condition more so than isolated cancer on its own. Or if it's a child who has a known family history. Anytime we see a known family history, we always wanna make sure we evaluate at-risk family members to provide them the care that they need. And so outside of our general you know, pediatrics department and some of the specialty clinics that I talked about, we also have the genetic testing clinic. So these are kind of, you know, these are our five genetic counselors in the genetic testing clinic, and they get involved in various different specialties. So this is a newer service that the hospital has that is designed to increase access to genetic counseling services across different specialties. So for our medical genetics department, we have patients that we see with geneticists or then some of the specialty clinics that we talked about, but there's not always enough need in neurology or other you know, cardiology outside of the clinics that we do once a week 
to have a full-time genetic counselor. And so the genetic testing clinic has an option where providers and other specialties here at Children, if they say that there's a specific test they want to order for a family and they need a genetic counselor to talk to them about it, someone from the GTC can come and coordinate that for the family. So what they do is very similar to the medical genetics department, what we do of pre-test and post-test counseling. This is an option for all specialties at Children's, you know, things like nephrology, hematology, other places, as well as collect family history, same that we would in medical genetics, analyze risk, navigate you know, laboratories, best testing options for the family. So this clinic not only sees patients, they also do utilization management. So making sure if a specialty wants to send out a test that it is the best test for that patient, where maybe there's a better one that because they're not an expert in genetics, they don't always realize that. So the GTC is a great resource that allows kind of a checks and balance system to make sure that the patient is getting the best type of genetic test. That leads me into the next insurance authorization. That's a big part of genetic counseling. So obtaining that, making sure that it is something that adheres to the insurance company's policies that usually require genetic counseling. So a lot of insurance companies are now saying before they approve genetic testing, they have to have an evaluation with a genetic counselor. And so this is another great way that the GTC can help expand genetic testing to patients who aren't maybe able to get an appointment with MedGen right away. They coordinate testing, and then they also have support from the refer referring physician as far as results and then follow-up testing if needed. And so our GTC genetic counselors get involved in some additional specialty clinics. So neurogenetics is a clinic that's done with the neurologist and a genetic counselor. So they work to coordinate genetic testing for suspected neurological conditions. So again, part of that pre-test genetic counseling, taking a family history, providing risk assessment, choosing the most appropriate test for the family and going through that insurance off process. And then the post-test counseling. So when the results come back, interpreting those, what does this mean for the patient and family moving forward? How does this affect medical management, walking the family through all of that? If it requires coordination of neurologic care, so for conditions such as epilepsy or movement disorders, and then making sure that they are appropriately referred for things outside of the neurology field. So if something comes back for a genetic condition, that means they also need to be seen by cardiology, making sure that those referrals happen. They also are involved in the muscular dystrophy clinic. So this is another multidisciplinary clinic through neurology, specifically for patients that are suspected to have or have been identified to have an inherited neuromuscular condition. This actually does have grant funding and support from the National Muscular Dystrophy Association and provides access for these families to clinical trials and initiatives to help better understand and treat these specific types of genetic conditions. So this clinic entails a neurologist, a genetic counselor, a pulmonologist, physical medicine and rehabilitation, you know, PT, and a nurse practitioner. There's also our cystic fibrosis clinic. So this is one that's through our pulmonologists and then a genetic counselor to work together for individuals who have CF. This is usually found after sweat testing, part of you know, newborn screening. So if you get a newborn screen and the result comes back inconclusive, you usually have a follow-up sweat test recommended to determine if the patient may have cystic fibrosis. Depending on the result, the genetic counselor meets with the family and will provide counseling for the newborn screening results. And if any additional genetic testing is required based on those sweat test results. So even with a sweat positive sweat test result, genetic testing is often still recommended for the gene associated with cystic fibrosis as confirmatory for that diagnosis, as well as to aid family members in potential carrier screening. So again, you'll see a lot of this is pre-test and post-test genetic counseling. We get involved up front, collecting that family history, risk assessment, choosing the most appropriate test, insurance off a similar process, and then discussion of the genetic testing results when we get them back, and if any follow-up testing needs to take place. We also have our primary care precision medicine clinic. So we'll see patients in this clinic for a variety of reasons, things such as pharmacogenomics, so how certain kind of genetic changes can influence how we metabolize drugs. Patients and families that have a genetic disorder and are looking for primary care in the context of that disorder. So it is collaboration with genetic specialists. Specialists, Not every PCP or pediatrician is well-versed in genetic conditions. And so sometimes families feel like it's better to have their primary care managed by genetics, just because it's someone who is more of an expert in that specific condition. They can also talk about direct-to-consumer genetic testing who have questions about results that come back, so 23andMe, things like that, that might be maybe a you know, patient ordered with their PCP and they want to talk to someone about the results. 
There's also services for adults and families in collaboration with the Children's Genetic Testing Clinic. Patients can also be referred from their PCP or other specialists for genetic testing recommendations, result interpretation, management, all of that. And then upstream filtering of patients to genetic specialists with downstream management as needed. So again, making sure that patients have appropriate referrals to different specialists as needed. Return of results. So there is the all of us and discovery studies that are coordinated through this clinic as well. And then early adopters, so patients seeking kind of a level of more novel care, really getting into that precision medicine. So personalized to you, to genetic conditions that you may have, really trying to get down to personalized medicine. And then we also have some ophthalmologic genetic counselors. So we have three dedicated genetic counselors in the ophthalmology department. And so these are for ocular genetic disorders. They can be present at birth. This can come up in childhood or even adulthood. And our ocular genetic disorders can affect one or many parts of the eye and visual system. So these genetic counselors are involved to coordinate, you know, finding a diagnosis, what the visual prognosis might be for these patients, as well as recurrence risks. They will also place referrals as needed based on the results to guide medical and surgical management, both within the Depart Department of Ophthalmology or outside departments if needed. All of the patients are evaluated by an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. They are different um, depending on kind of the level of exam that they do on the eye. And that can sometimes include imaging or functional testing for vision. The genetic counseling and testing services are incorporated entirely within the ophthalmology department. So they do offer in-person consultations the same day as the eye examination to talk with families. They can do telemedicine. So this is something that we've been able to offer more so with COVID-19, trying to still see patients without requiring that they come into the hospital. And so that can be arranged for established patients. Obviously, it's difficult to do an eye exam you know, online, and so they have to be seen at least in person one time. And then they can also coordinate low vision services for patients as needed. And so now I wanted to highlight our genetic counselors. So obviously, we're doing this through video. You don't have a chance to kind of see all of us. We're in a tiny room here. So I just wanted to highlight a few of our genetic counselors to show our different interests, the different programs that we went to, how long we've been a genetic counselor. So that's myself on the left. I actually graduated from the University of Oklahoma before moving here to Pittsburgh. I graduated in 2018, so I've been here just about two years now. And I'm involved in the general pediatrics clinic as well as the sickle cell clinic. Um, I have a cat named Blue, so that's my major interest at home. Been making candles a lot during the pandemic, and then I also enjoy hiking. Uh, Elena, who I have listed on the right, she is our resident gardener and has answered all of the questions that we have about gardening as a new hobby because of COVID. She actually went to the University of Pittsburgh here, graduated in 2010, and she's been at Children's for seven years now. So she's involved in our general pediatrics clinic as well as our oncology, that cancer predisposition clinic. As I said, she's our gardener here. She's involved in pretty much anything outdoors and enjoys traveling. And this is a picture of her with one of her dogs, Lily. We also have Sarah Hunter. She's another transplant like myself where she went to Virginia Commonwealth, graduated in 2019. So she's been here about a year and a half now, mostly involved in our general pediatrics clinic. You know, I wanted to highlight some of the things that we do outside of clinic. We talked a lot about genetic counseling, so showing that we do have interest outside of work. So. You'll see hiking on here several times for Sarah, and then that's her dog, Brody. We also have Rebecca. So she and Sarah started around the same time. Rebecca actually went to University of Pittsburgh as well. That's a common theme for most of our genetic counselors here. Rebecca also graduated in 2019, but she's actually been at Children's about three and a half years now. She was here for two years as a genetic counseling assistant to start off with, and then we scooped her once she graduated and got her as a full-blown genetic counselor here. She's involved in our general pediatrics clinic, you know, her quarantine addition for her personal interest, reading, running, puzzles, baking, all good stuff. Josh is one of our genetic counselors here as well. He actually went to Arcadia, has been here about three years now, graduated in 2017 from his master's program. He's one of the genetic counselors who's in our, our general pediatrics as well as our lysosomal storage disorder clinic. Josh is a big one for tennis, being asked to play that, cooking, reading, and also board games. Before COVID, the number of times we'd get together to play board games, it was a good time. Josh got a, a lovely dog that you can see here, Tino. Um, I'll leave it up to you to decide if Tino is really that small or if the leaf is actually that big. 
and Michaela. So she and I were hired in the same year. So she went to the University of Cincinnati. We've both been here about two years now. She's interested in general pediatrics and then also interested in neurodevelopmental disorders. So her interests include crafting, baking, and then that's her dog Ace, who loves to go on hikes, as you can see. We also have Leslie. So Leslie also went to Pittsburgh here, graduated in 2017. So she's been at Children's for three years. And she's one of our inpatient genetic counselors, but also is interested in general pediatrics as well as cardiology. Um, Leslie's very interested in traveling and then used to play rugby back in undergrad and also has an interest in forensic science before she became a genetic counselor. She, here she is with an owl named Guinevere from when she was in Scotland, so very well-traveled. Laura Jenkins, as you met her earlier when she was talking to you about our clinic, she also went to University of Pittsburgh and graduated in 1995. Um, undergrad, she went to Bucknell, so she's one of the genetic counselors here who actually her undergrad was in psychology and English. Most of us, our undergrad tended to be more biology focused, so she's our, our local psychoanalyst here. So she's been a genetic counselor for a long time, but we've only had the pleasure of having her at Children's for the last five years. Uh, her GC interests are anything and everything going on, so Laura is a jack of all trades. She has boating. We like to, we love all to go on her boat sometime when we can get together again, reading, hiking, her family, and as you can see in the picture, she loves big chocolate labs. So that's her dog, Cappy. This picture does not do Cappy's size justice, um, but he's a very cute dog. Speaking of cute dogs, that leads me into Sarah Drews Williams. So in her picture, she just got a little puppy named Millie. She went to University of Michigan. I actually went to Michigan for undergrad, so I'm gonna say go blue every time I say that for some of our genetic counselors. Sarah graduated there from 2017, so she's been here about three and a half years now. She's involved in our general pediatrics clinic, and then also is in the inborn errors and metabolism clinic. So she likes running, traveling, and then obviously playing with her puppy, Millie. We also have Rachel. So Rachel graduated from Pittsburgh in 2019. She's been with us just over a year now, and she's actually part-time in our general pediatrics clinic as well as the pulmonology clinic. Um, you know, does anything outdoors, reading, biking, you'll see we're all very outdoor motivated here. We also have Nadine. So Nadine beats out Laura Jenkins by one year. She graduated in 94 from Pittsburgh. So she's been at Children's. She says too many to count, but if you press her, she'll say 26 years. And she's predominantly involved in our lysosomal storage disorders clinic. Um, she likes doing anything that her kids are doing, which includes dancing, ice hockey, escape rooms, travel, all good things that we would love to get back to post-COVID. We also have Linford Williams, so he also went to Michigan for his master's program, so go Bloom. He graduated in 2016 and has been at Children's for three years now. He's one of our other inpatient genetic counselors, but also enjoys general pediatrics and disorders of sexual development. Personal interests are traveling, swimming, and then the various sports. So we used to get together to watch Michigan football, and then also enjoys, you have to clarify, European soccer. And then so Charlotte, Charlotte is one of the GTC genetic counselors here. So she also graduated from Pittsburgh in 2019. So she's been here just over a year and a half now. Enjoys general pediatrics, neurogenetics, and then health policy. So that's something that a lot of our GTC gets involved in as well, just because of the nature of genetic testing clinic, being involved in the insurance off process, making sure that we are following insurance policies. And so our GTC works really closely with our UPMC health insurance as far as putting together policies, when should we approve certain types of genetic testings for you know, certain conditions and medical features. Her interests are her two dogs, baking, cooking, eating good food, you know, enjoying nature and live music. And then we also have Kelly. Kelly went to Brandeis University, graduated this year. So she's been at Children's just a few months now. And she's in our ophthalmology department, also interested in pediatrics, enjoys animals, travel, and food. So I'm told this is a lion that she saw on her honeymoon. Very exciting stuff. And so now to talk about Talked about genetic counseling, what we do here at Children's, all the different specialties we get involved in, the different roles that we play. So how do I become a genetic counselor? You need a master's degree in genetic counseling. So as Laura talked about earlier, this means going to an accredited program in the US or in Canada. And so we wanted to briefly include the requirements typically to apply to these programs. So this is with a big asterisk, not every program will have all of these requirements. Make sure that you look at the individual programs that you're checking off all of those boxes. But typically, the requirements include a bachelor's degree either in biology, biochem, genetics, psychology, or a related field. 
really, you could major in anything in undergrad, but a lot of it is just that you have taken the required science classes when applying for grad school. Typically, advocacy experience of some kind is required. Usually, that's involved working at like a, you know, a support hotline. I personally volunteered at a sexual assault and domestic violence shelter when I was an undergrad. So something that shows that you can talk to people, learn you know, empathy, how to have those responses, and can handle high-stress situations like that. Also required to take the GRE, so an exam that you're required to take when applying for grad school. And then shadowing experience. Obviously, that's very difficult right now with COVID. We're not allowing in-person shadowing. And so trying to do the best you can in times where that is allowed or at institutions, trying to see in person what does an actual genetic testing or genetic counseling session look like? You know, what does it actually look like to talk to a family, to walk them through this process, to take a family history? You usually need a personal statement why you want to become a genetic counselor, letters of recommendation. And then not often required, but highly encouraged is experience in a clinic such as a genetic counseling assistant. So as I said you know, earlier, Rebecca, she was one of our GCAs here at Children's. That's a great way for your individuals to learn about genetic counseling and also to see the behind the scenes stuff that genetic counselors do. It's not just about counseling patients, it's all of that other stuff that Laura touched on of obtaining insurance off, prepping for it, following the results afterwards. So by being a GCA, it gives you really valuable experience to see what it's truly like at all hours of the day to be a genetic counselor. Once you've gotten your master's degree, usually it's required that you are board certified through the American Board of Genetic Counseling. And then licensure is also a thing. So this varies state by state. Not every state requires licensure for genetic counselors. So that's something that in Pennsylvania we do. And usually licensure requires board certification. So it's something that more and more states are adopting and we're trying to work towards. But for now, it's still not the same in all 50 states. And then these are some resources that you can look into. So the first one is going to be the NSGC.org. So that is the National Society of Genetic Counselors. They have a page on becoming a genetic counselor. So going through all of that information, they have a list of the accredited programs in the states right now where you can apply. They also have put together the aboutgeneticcounselors.org. So this is also a nice resource for learning more about that application process, all of those requirements. And that actually has a link to the Master Genetic Counselor Series. So this is a great resource, especially in COVID because you aren't able to shadow in person. The Master Genetic Counselor Series is a videos of kind of mock genetic counseling sessions that allow you to see what a session is. So I believe there's examples of cancer, prenatal and pediatrics, just to give you somewhat of an understanding of what it looks like. And so if you're not able to get a shadowing experience in person right now and are applying to programs, I would highly recommend that you try to watch those videos and that way you can at least talk about something to show that you've kind of seen a genetic counseling session. I also listed some books, these are my personal recommendations. Some of these were required reading for me when I was applying to grad school for Oklahoma. And they're all about learning a perspective other than your own. So in genetic counseling, you know, we're not the same thing as doctors. We're here to kind of bond with the families, to walk them through this process and to be the go-between to other medical providers. And a big part of that comes with learning empathy and how to talk with patients and how to put yourself in their shoes to think about what their worries are gonna be. So some of these books such as Carrier, the still point of the turning world, the spirit catches you and you fall down. Those are about individuals who have a family history, you know, something going on for genetics and what they did. So for Carrier, she's a carrier for an X-linked condition and talks about what does that mean to be a female character for a condition that she's seen family members with and being in the first generation that has the option to do something about it, whether it's through pre-implantation genetic testing, you know, doing genetic testing during the pregnancy, she is now the first person in her family that could choose to not bring a child into the world with this condition. So to get that perspective of someone who's actually walked through that, you know, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down is a great book on what it's like to have cultural differences. It's the Hmong population coming to California. What is it like when you have an, a culture that's not American coming to an Americanized healthcare system? You know, the disconnect that can happen between doctors and patients when there's not only a language barrier, but a massive cultural one where maybe they don't think of these genetic conditions the same way we do. So just trying to offer that alternative perspective to, to see what would it be like to talk to families like this. She has her mother's laugh. That's more about kind of the history of hereditary, things that are hereditary, aren't kind of walking you through a lot of this. Um, the gene, that's the only one, unfortunately, that I haven't read, but a lot of people have recommended it to me. So a history of kind of the gene, how it's come up. 
The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks is a great book about Henrietta Lacks whose cells were kind of taken from her and are used as the basis of a lot of medical research right now. So again, it's providing that perspective on what can we do to be advocates for our patients to make sure that they don't get taken advantage of, that they have informed consent for anything that they are agreeing to. Um, the still point of the turning world is about a woman who had a child with Tay-Sachs disease unexpectedly. You know, what is it like to get that genetic diagnosis for something that has a reduced life expectancy? How does it feel to walk through that? Um, so these are all books that, while they don't teach you how to be a genetic counselor, I think they're very valuable for showing you different perspectives, kind of giving you things that you might not necessarily learn in a program, but can help get you started along this path towards becoming a genetic counselor. And so with that, we'll move on to questions. So I'm gonna put my mask back on and then Laura and Ashley are gonna join me. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Bear with us. Just while we're figuring this out, this is Ashley Lahr. She's uh, one of our genetic counselors as well. There we go. Hi. Uh, hopefully you can all hear us okay with masks on. Here's speaking a little bit. Oh, no, wait, wrong way. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're just gonna take some questions and the answers now. Um, I have bad eyes, so. I can um, read the question. Can read the question, okay. <laughs> so the first question is, is it hard to find a job as a genetic counselor and how much is the beginning salary? Oh, so that's a really good question. So in terms of finding a job now, as opposed to 1995, um, I think that there are actually a tremendous number of jobs that are available. Um, again, it's such a growing field. And even though there's you know 5,000 plus genetic counselors, there's just an exponential sort of need for genetic counselors that, that way supersedes that 5,000. So typically, I think there are a lot of jobs that are available. Um, the starting salary is a little harder to sort of comment on. A lot of it depends on where you are in the country. Uh, a lot of it depends on the type of job. So there are also genetic counselor jobs in what we call industry. So where genetic counselors will actually work with a testing lab. Um, sometimes those salaries tend to pay a little bit higher than positions in an academic setting. Um, and really that's true for, even if you're not a genetic counselor, if you're a physician or any other sort of worker, um, you know, the, the private industry tends to pay a little bit more than the um, academic industry. So, um, you know, but certainly a, a decent salary uh, to live on, but, you know, it's not also one where you'll be making millions of dollars. <laughs> so, but, but definitely I feel like, you know, that's also something that a lot of institutions and the National Society of Genetic Counselors is working on to increase, you know, career ladders. Our supervisor here at Children's has worked very hard to, um, you know, work with HR and develop a career ladder so that we can sort of have specific promotions and make more money. Um, so that was a really huge thing. And, and NSGC is really working, um, you know, to just sort of um, increase the salary, really. And some of it is also tied to billing. Um, not all states allow genetic counselors to bill and not in, all insurance companies allow that as well. And so, again, it differs in terms of, you know, what state you work in, that kind of thing. So I don't know if Ashley or Emily want to add anything to that or... I'll add one thing is it's also not just about salary, but also about benefits that you get with that. Mm -hmm. So at Children's, we get kind of a yearly amount to go to conferences for continuing education. You know, if you're a new time grad like Ashley was, boards gets paid for that first time to become certified. You know, so it's, it's keeping in mind things outside of just base salary, that there are also benefits outside of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent point. And as someone who just went through the job hunt myself, it was really, there were a lot of opportunities out there for whatever specialty you want to go into. And so I didn't feel like I was unable to find something I was interested in, um, especially pediatrics, which obviously is where I ended up. <laughs> And we're glad she did. <laughs> All right, so the next question is, what is the best thing that you like about your job and what is the least favorite thing that you have to do in your job? Uh -huh. I can go first. So I love, I chose pediatrics as a specialty as opposed to cancer or prenatal because I love the follow-up with families. You know, seeing them back six months, a year later, watching them as they continue to grow and really feeling like you, you know, for an hour every six months are part of their lives. My least favorite part is the insurance health process. Mm -hmm. That's, that's it, hands down. <laughs> yeah, I agree with a lot of what um, Emily said in terms of the relationships that you develop with families. 
not all families. Some families you see them once and then they either never follow up or, you know, low genetic risk. So there's, they're not recommended to come back or what have you. But there are those families where you, you really go on their journey with them. And so that can be very, very rewarding. Um, I agree as well. The insurance office is a hassle. Um, there also is another aspect of this job that I'm not sure Emily or I really talked about, but there is a tremendous amount of follow-up and tracking that has to be done. Um, you know, any genetic testing that's ordered, labs that are ordered, imaging that's ordered, you know, when the patient's supposed to follow up, all that kind of stuff is sort of on the genetic counselor to follow, at least here. And so just being able to keep track of that. So organizational skills and multitasking skills are 100% essential to do this job. And so that for me is a little bit challenging sometimes. So. Yeah, I, I agree with everything. I think that my favorite part of my job in pediatrics is that you never know what's coming through the door. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it can definitely get a little chaotic here in this specialty, but genetic counseling is a forever learning kind of job and you definitely get that here in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. I also love the variety that pediatrics give you, gives you too. I have an interest in lysosomal storage disorders and she said they're right down the hallway. So you, you never are shy of new information or what you like around here. I think I definitely agree with Laura and Emily as well on the, the downside is you do do a lot of tracking as a pediatric genetic counselor. And it means that you have to really follow up with all the families and, and remember everything that you did in all of your sessions and things of that nature. And it definitely speaks to the relationship we have with our patients, but it's definitely not due to lack of trying and, and effort on our part. Mm -hmm. Lots of questions coming in. So what types of classes should I take in college if I want to be a genetic counselor? So as I mentioned, probably reaching out to those individual programs, looking at what lists that they usually have of classes that are required. Obviously, genetics is going to be a big one if you can take that before applying to a program. So having a strong biology and science background. But Laura majored in psychology, so having that as well for the counseling aspect. I know one when I was applying many years ago was abnormal psychology, where not every program had that as a requirement, but then several of them had that as like a, you know, preferred if you have already taken that. And that was when I happened to take an undergrad. And so looking at kind of those alternatives, I would say to look at probably the program websites to see what they list as requirements, but any major in bio, biochem, genetics, that'll usually cover all the boxes. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, if you can, if you're, program uh, that you're interested in or if your undergrad doesn't require it, anatomy and physiology can be really helpful, mm -hmm. especially if you're interested in peds or obviously genetic counseling in general. I personally didn't have to take an anatomy class when I was in undergrad and it wasn't provided at my program and I think that that can be really helpful information because we do work full body system when you're a genetic counselor or a geneticist. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Is it hard to get into a genetic counseling program? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's the short answer. There's a lot of requirements and it is a very competitive field. There are not a lot of programs um, in the States and Canada that offer this master's. So that just limits the number of people that can apply. I don't remember the exact number, but I thought I read at least a few years ago, it was about a thousand applicants for like 300 open spots. Mm -hmm. Those numbers might have changed now since I was applying, but it can be difficult. Obviously, it can be done. You have three people in front of you right now showing that you can do it. It is not uncommon to not get in the first application cycle. I personally got in the second year that I applied, so it's a great opportunity to, you know, I applied as a senior from undergrad when I was approaching graduation, and then after I graduated and I unfortunately didn't get into a program, I then was able to use that extra time to really try to beef up my resume and to show that I truly was interested in this profession. And now, four some odd years later, here I am. I would add two to that. So I, again, I'm, I'm sort of old school, graduating in 1995. And I worked for five years after I graduated from college in a medical field. I was a medical, I've sold pharmaceuticals. Um, but even, you know, if you're thinking about genetic counseling, I think it really helped to have, for me to have some job experience um, in the medical field, but obviously nothing to do with genetics. Um, but still just to get a feel for you know the medical field in general so it's not always a bad idea to work for a couple years as well and then it also gives you life experience which is a huge component of this job as well 
Um, and I would also add too, in terms of classes to take, we do a tremendous amount of writing. So whether it's a clinic note or a letter to the family or a letter to insurance, there's, I mean, we write novels every day. Probably. <laughs> and so, you know, having writing skills, I think is really important as well. So even as an undergrad, you know, just to make sure you have some, some writing, you know, I don't know what kind of classes that even is, but you know, just the ability to write is also really critical. Yeah, I, I, I went through a similar process that many of you might have on my second round applying. I went through the match system and that can be tough as well. I think that everything that Emily and Laura said are great advice. I also worked as a GCA here at Children's mm -hmm. for about three years. I worked through grad school here too. I think it's a great opportunity to learn and get experience. It's definitely not the only experience that is out there. I also worked at the Carnegie Science Center here in Pittsburgh for a long time. And I did. I had to do shows where I taught kids about how to make ice cream <laughs> using, um, using liquid nitrogen. And while maybe you might not see the relationship right away, it taught me how to take complex medical terminology and concepts and explain them to people in a way that they can understand, which is something we do every day. So if you find something that you're passionate about or that you have fun with, it can be great experience no matter what. Yeah. What things can I do to prepare me to apply to a genetic counseling program that would make me a better candidate? I feel like we sort of addressed that in that previous question. Um, you know, GPA is certainly important. GRE scores are important, classes that you take are important. And then, you know, what's going to differentiate you from all the other individuals who have similar, like high, G, you know, GPA and GRE are those sort of the extracurricular uh, exposures. So I think that those would be really important and not just sort of the fluff in terms of like, oh, I observed, you know, a counseling hotline or I did a, you know, um, suicide hotline, but, you know, only for a month. Like really to dig into some sort of volunteer or paid activity that that really immerses you in uh, that sort of uh, environment, and I think that would go a long way too. But uh, some of the other things we talked about as well are important. I think piggyback off of that, really being genuine in what you're doing. So like Laura said, don't volunteer just for a month because you want to check off that advocacy box. I mean, you're doing these things because these are important skills to have as a genetic counselor. So, you know, give it your all. So really showing that you're committed to this, that you see the value in doing those types of things and, and how they can help you out in your career. I agree with all of that. I think this is all really good advice or with how uh, competitive the applications are now. Variety and making sure you understand what the experience is for is really great. Mm -hmm. And I do want to emphasize that every individual aspect is important, but it's not the end all be all. So if you're applying for schools and maybe your GPA isn't the highest, or maybe you didn't quite get as much advocacy experience as you would like, I mean, still apply, even if you don't apply to a ton of programs, just to go through that application process to get familiar with it. Um, I applied for eight programs the second year that I was applying. I think the first year I applied for three, so I definitely upped my number. Don't get too focused on the one and only program that you want to go to. And don't be afraid to apply, even just for that experience, even if not every part of your application is perfect, because they do counter that, where maybe your GPA or your GRE scores aren't what you would like them to be, but you have amazing advocacy experience. And all of that is taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. What is the toughest thing you've dealt with as a GC, and how did you deal with it? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Uh, I think so. I'll, I'll take that one, I guess. So um, I think that for me, it was um, doing so in my previous genetic counseling life, actually, not even so much here, but it was doing um, the predictive testing for Huntington's disease. And so I think that um, one of the toughest things I think genetic counselors, in my opinion, deal with is giving people information about what might happen in the future or in Huntington's disease, you know, what will happen in your future uh, to a perfectly healthy individual. So, you know, in pediatrics, even if we're sometimes giving news that can be devastating to families, typically the child already has a health issue of some kind. So it's not as necessarily sort of, you know, kind of slamming the patient with that news that they're not expecting at all. Not all the time, obviously, but um, and so I think for me, it was, you know, talking to individuals who were my age at the time, you know, in their 20s or 30s, 
and we're perfectly healthy and saying, unfortunately, you know, at some point in your near future, you will be, you know, start becoming debilitated and pass away at an early age. So, so that for me was one of the toughest. And, you know, I think that um, how you handle it or how you deal with it um, is again, part of it is just that relationship with the person, right? And remembering that they're a human being just like you and just like you would sort of deal with it as you deal with your friends' challenges or, you know, whoever. And so, yeah, it can be really devastating. Uh, you deal with it just like you would any sort of grief or challenging, you know, situation in your own life. I mean, I think that was a great example. I don't have a, a specific patient example as much, but more so for me, what was also tough is just starting off as a new genetic counselor which Ashley can probably attest to right now, where <laughs> you've gone through your training, you've taken boards, you've passed, and now you're not on your own. Ashley has a lot of resources for us here, but I know personally when I started, I was in a new city with new coworkers and starting to feel like, yes, I can do this. You know, I am competent. I do have the resources and the training to handle difficult situations where if a family starts crying or gets angry, more so knowing that I can handle this. I, I know what to do in those situations. So. It can be tough when you first start off because now you're you're pushed into the real world and you're going, I no longer have a supervisor watching me. I don't have that safety net. <laughs> um, so for me, that was a big hurdle to overcome where now I feel like I'm in a good place. I hope Ashley feels like she can always come to us if she needs to, but she can maybe weigh in more on, on being that, that brand new GCU. Yeah, I think that that is definitely one of the hardest parts. I mean, any program that you guys will hopefully attend, I think that there's great training out there, but it definitely, you feel the training wheels come off pretty fast <laughs> uh, once you become a new GC. But yeah, I'm, I'm so lucky here. I have a lot of really great uh, people to talk to and ask questions to. As you can see, there's a whole little squad here that I can ask questions to. I mean, a lot of us go through that imposter syndrome, but like Emily said, if you trust, if you trust your your coworkers and your training, it definitely gets easier. And I and I agree with Laura too. I've been um, involved in some pretty tough disclosures myself, even as a student. But I always think to myself that if there's anybody who's going to be talking to the family, um, I'm glad it's me because of the relationship that I established and also the training you get as a genetic counselor as well. Um, because even obviously you might not be able to make them feel the best in that moment, but you can at least be what they need. And I think that that's such an important role as a genetic counselor. Yeah. Well said. All right. What is the part of that. hardest part of the job? I think we've, yeah, I I think we've addressed that, yeah. hopefully. If not, put us another question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it again. Does it matter where I took the prereq classes and how recently? So this person graduated with their bachelor's, but they're wondering if the certificate of completion is enough or if you need course transcripts for a few science courses. I would actually defer that question to the specific program you're looking at. I'm not yeah. sure we really have the, um, the knowledge of the, that specifics about the application process. So I would maybe look at, you know, what programs are you thinking about and, and call them and contact them. I'm sure they would be more than happy to answer that question. So. Uh, sorry to turp it, but I, I think we, I don't want to give you the wrong information. So. I, I will say that one class you can take if you're interested is the online embryology course at Cincinnati. It's one that a lot of programs recommend. Um, and you definitely will get some embryology in your training as well, one way or another. So if you're interested in more science courses, maybe to beef up your GPA, um, if it's not where exactly you want it to be, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. What is something that made you stand out as an applicant to a GC master's program? Uh, for me, I think it was some of the variety. So between kind of that gap year, between when I was a senior graduating from undergrad, starting it, I had a kind of unique job at the Transportation Research Institute at Michigan, where I was doing research, but more from an engineering perspective. So things like that, that make you, you know, it's not the same experience as everyone else. And really, no matter what your experience is, as long as you're able to spin it in some way to how it's relevant for genetic counseling, as Ashley said earlier, being at the Carnegie Museum and saying how she was learning how to you know, teach children in terms that they can understand these complex things. So for me, that job meant I was very up, and, up close and personal with individuals. We did a lot of 3D scanning of people who were wearing just spandex shorts. So whenever you get that close touching people when they're not wearing a lot of clothes, <laughs> you learn how to put them at ease. So really just doing something that makes you stand out which could be anything, uh, 
Uh, one of our coworkers, Sarah Hunter from Vermont, originally worked at an orchard and talked about that when she interviewed here for a job. So really anything that you've done, whether it was in high school, undergrad, in a gap year, I feel like for me, just anything unique you know, that, that says who you are. Yeah. I think that what I would add to that, um, I mean, for me, I think it was having a job outside of genetics, but in healthcare. Uh, and being a little bit older, you know, having worked for five years out of undergrad um, and coming with some maturity, like just life experience. Um, I also think that um, I just lost, totally lost my train of thought. But, you know, so anything that shows how committed you are to being a genetic counselor. So, you know, be it that you've applied three times or you applied the first time and you got specific feedback. And then you were able to show how you approached with great zeal and effort to fill those gaps, right? And so again, not just kind of checking the boxes, but saying, I want this so much that this is what I'm willing to do, you know, to work 60 hours a week and then volunteer as well or whatever it be. So anything that shows how passionate you are about being a genetic counselor, because it's not an easy job. You will work long hours. You know, and you're not making a million dollars. So you really like have to, to be, this. I know, right? <laughs> but I mean, you have to be realistic about it, right? You, like, you really have to love it. You don't have to. Obviously, you can be a good genetic counselor and, you know, work 40 hours a week. But it's it's a passion as well as a, as a job. So uh, I would just say anything that shows how passionate you are about getting into a program and being a genetic counselor it would go a long way to making you stand out. Yeah. And I think, you know, piggybacking off of that, show that you have an understanding of the field as well. Yeah, I, I really do think that the first time I applied as an undergrad my senior year, when I read that personal statement, I, I wouldn't have accepted me because <laughs> I, I didn't even explain why I wanted to be a genetic counselor well, or even that I understood what a genetic counselor did. And so then once I became a GCA the year after and did more shadowing, I felt like I got a better grip on what a genetic counselor does and the role. And then that was the year I got in. And so I, I really feel like you have to show them that you have an understanding for a lot of the reasons that Laura yeah. mentioned, mm -hmm. just because of, again, that competitiveness, but also because it's a field of people who really have a passion for it. And, and so go get some good experience, definitely. Yeah, that's great advice. To understand the field is huge. So, yeah. How do you determine what specialty to have? So I can go first. I, I picked pediatrics because, like I said, I wanted to have that follow-up with them. Um, I don't feel super passionate about cancer or prenatal. In pediatrics, we will do a little bit of that counseling in sessions as it comes up. So if you're taking a family history, you see that mom had breast cancer when she was 35, you know, that it comes up a lot and early, you're going to have to on the spot do a little bit of, of counseling for that but to not have that as the main focus. So I love interacting with kids. As I said, I like to see them back for follow-up. You know, you see them year after year. The doctor that I work with, one of her favorite questions around October is what's your Halloween costume gonna be? You know, <laughs> seeing those pictures and, and truly getting them back for follow-up. So for me, that was my big motivation for, for beans. Yeah, so I've done a little bit of everything except prenatal. Um, so I actually started in peds, then did cancer genetics when it was sort of in its infancy. Uh, and then when I came back to the field, really felt drawn to pediatrics. Um, I think again, due to the variety. And I think as uh, Ashley said earlier, it's like you never know what's gonna walk through the door. <laughs> I mean, it is something new every day, every week. Um, and I think you also, I mean, I actually I shouldn't say this, but I feel like we also see a lot of psychosocial components that more frequently in pediatrics, not that they don't occur in cancer and prenatal, they absolutely do. Um, but I think because the kid, like because we're dealing with children primarily, there also is a lot of that other psychosocial um, stuff that comes with the the family dynamic, et cetera. And so I think that adds to the challenge as well, and just makes it very interesting and allows you to utilize your skills a lot. So and of course you do that in all the specialties. I don't mean to say that you don't, but um, I just like the variety. I think. Not bored. You're not bored. <laughs> That's correct. <right. laughs> Never a dull moment. I actually thought I wanted to do prenatal for a little bit, and then what I ended up going through my rotations at my program, and I just got drawn back to pediatrics. I was between pediatrics and prenatal as a GCA, but I again, I chose pediatrics for a lot of the same reasons as Laura. 
Um, also because I have the interest in the lysosomal storage disorders mm -hmm. as well, I ended up doing my thesis with our team here as well as an optional rotation. And so again, I, I like to be around a lot of different things, especially the things I'm interested in. And so pediatrics just felt right. Are there opportunities to shadow or to be a GCA at Children's? So right now we're not allowing shadowing due to COVID. Before then we were allowing in-person shadowing. So you'd reach out to the department, we'd have you sign some forms and things of release um, to do that. Unfortunately, right now we don't have that opportunity. And to be a GCA right now, I don't believe we have any open positions. We do occasionally have them open, such as when we promoted Ashley from GCA to genetic counselor. Um, we have filled that position. So I believe for this year we are full, yeah, but I would encourage you to keep, yeah, um, you know, keep looking online at different places. It doesn't even have to be just at children. So you can keep looking, I don't know the best website, UPMC careers or something along yeah, those lines? Yeah, I might even suggest like um, looking at um, some of the different major medical institutions and finding out who's the head of the genetics department and just emailing them and saying, you know, hey, do you have a GCA uh, that works for you? I'd be interested in any openings that are available. Um, and then maybe the NSGC website might be a good place to go as well. I will add to that we have a lot of people who want to shadow, so it's not just genetic counseling. People are interested in genetic genetic counseling, but we have you know medical fellows and genetic fellows and medical residents and students and things. And so typically, we don't have the time or the ability to have like high school students shadow us. Um, it typically has to be someone who you know is um, like you know a, a college senior or someone who is really in the thick of sort of thinking about this as a career and applying to a program just so you're not disappointed you know if you're a, a junior in high school and, and want to learn more usually you'll be sort of lower on the list only because we don't have the space or the capacity to handle all the people who want to shadow so um, piggybacking off of reaching out to like the medical geneticist directors for programs on nsgc there is a find a genetic counselor page on the nsgc.org mm -hmm. website and oftentimes they'll say if they're open to contact by students or individuals. And so that can be a good resource where if you, maybe you're not in the Pittsburgh area, you're somewhere else to see if there's a genetic counselor in your area that you can reach out to as well. You know, trying to contact people in different areas. We aren't offering a chance to kind of virtually shadow, but I believe I've heard that some institutions potentially are if they're for like telemedicine visits. So I would encourage to continue to reach out, especially hopefully as COVID resolves, uh, <laughs> reaching back out to us once things are a little more normal and we can resume the shadowing opportunities. When choosing grad programs to apply to, should you consider if you want to live there long term, considering many of the genetic counselors here graduated from Pitt, or is it easier to find employment elsewhere? I, I think that um, Location is definitely important, but I don't necessarily think it's the most important for afterwards. I, I, I can personally say that a few of my classmates in a class of 12, uh, three of us, including myself, so two others stayed in Pittsburgh, but the rest of my classmates went other uh, to other institutions. And so I think that it's important to know if you like the city for two years for sure but i think that because like laura and emily have both said the job is taking people across the country and across the world it's definitely just a matter of what specialty you want to think of when you're thinking about jobs later um, as well as honestly where you want to be and what you want to do and what opportunities are out there I personally wanted to stay in Pittsburgh because I have family here and I also love my coworkers. <laughs> and so, but I, I think that um, a degree at any of the institutions can take you pretty far, which is great. Mm -hmm. I would say I went to the program in Oklahoma. There were five of us. It's a smaller program than here at Pitt. None of us stayed in Oklahoma following graduation. <laughs> and then the class behind me, I believe two of them stayed out of five. So it really can depend on do you want to stay in that area? Do you want to move elsewhere? Um, for me, I was more interested in pediatrics you know, as a physician, so I was looking for any location that had a heat job. I grew up in Michigan, so I was hoping to try to get a little bit closer to there than where I was in Oklahoma, so that was my major motivation. Um, it wasn't that crazy to interview here, even with a program in the city, I still got the job, so we were, you know, I don't think there's 
too much of that going on. Obviously, it can be helpful for applying as far as networking. You know, Ashley had an in with us. I think we coached her a little bit. Uh, we didn't want to let her go, so there is that aspect. But I don't think it's going to be to your detriment if you attend a program in a city different than where you want to end up. I think even more important when choosing a graduate program um, is to understand what the strengths are of the program that you're looking at mm -hmm. and sort of what you're looking for. So, you know, some programs, um, they set up the rotations for you, the clinical rotations for you, um, and they're very localized. Some of them are more spread out and you might travel to go to different uh, rotations, or they may have more of an emphasis in, you know, psychosocial counseling versus the medical side of things. So I think I would sort of choose your program based on the program that seems like the best fit for you, and then use location as your second tier decision maker, uh, if that makes any sense. So, yeah. And Ashley can attest to the match process, but mm -hmm. when yeah. you're interviewing at programs, you know, they're interviewing you for when you apply for the graduate program. You're also interviewing them. You know, you want to pick a place that is a good fit for you. So if you are fortunate enough to have interviews at multiple locations, ask them the hard questions. Really think about that city. Could you see yourself at that program? What does it have to offer? You know, for me, I really enjoyed Oklahoma's program. That was one of my more top choices after interviewing at other places, just because of the people that I interacted with there. I really felt like I meshed quite well. And so that was my number one choice. They didn't have a match program when I was applying, so Ashley can also weigh in on that a little bit. But I understand you basically rank the programs yeah. and you get told where you're going to go. <laughs> yeah, it definitely makes it a little tricky because it's not the old way of doing the phone calls. I think that when it comes to the match, again, like Emily said, if you're fortunate enough to have more than one interview, really think about your rankings. And you'll see that the match is a little more complicated than just one track. Uh, programs tend to have multiple tracks that include scholarships. And so really think about your ranking because it's not impossible that you don't get your first choice, which is okay. Um, but definitely you wanna make sure that you end up in a place that you feel like was best for you. I always tell people too that one of the things to think about when you're looking at a program is your own learning style. So I went to Pitt and I know I learn better when I'm in the field or when I'm doing hands-on things. And so I liked the program because the whole second year is where basically full-time in clinic and that so that's where I feel like I got most of my experience but some people like a stepwise approach or like to spread out their training and different programs offer different learning styles and different ways of navigating through your training so really look into that mm -hmm. yeah. and also a lot of programs have different you know most of them are two years I believe it's John Hopkins that might be a slightly longer program of three years so keeping in mind time limit as well as other opportunities so Pitt also has the option here to do a master's in public health as well as in genetic counseling, not every program has that. So thinking about when applying to programs, what type of genetic counselor do you wanna be, the specialties you wanna go into, and then is that a program that can check off all of those boxes for you? So if you're really passionate about public policy, you know, insurance, getting things like that approved, you know, doing a master's in public health may be a good option for you as well, where instead of spending a total of four years, two on each master's, I believe they can do it in three years. So truly keeping track, when I was applying, I had a, a great big spreadsheet of all of the <laughs> pros and cons of different programs. How long did it take? Application fees, cost of tuition, obviously that's a big factor. And so, you know, rather than just location, truly keeping in mind what is the best decision overall for you? I think he answered that. Uh, in <laughs> All right, uh, I'm really interested in working in a specialty clinic, but most shadowing is in cancer. Do we have any recommendations for additional experience? So I think just going back to things that we've already talked about, obviously shadowing is a little tricky right now. Um, I'm not sure where you've been looking, uh, you know, that most of it's in cancer. Um, you know, we certainly have people who shadow here. So I think just being persistent and um, you know, again, keeping COVID in mind, you know, just keep reaching out for opportunities. There certainly are opportunities in prenatal and, and uh, pediatric as well. Um, so I think with COVID, we kind of can't give you any more specific recommendations right now. Um, but definitely we have people shadow with us and I know that prenatal does as well. So, yeah, okay. Is there a specific point in your journey to become a genetic counselor that you needed to declare a specialty or have one in mind? No, 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 you take, you graduate, you have a master's in genetic counseling, you all take the same boards exam. There's not one that's specific for peds versus prenatal versus cancer. We all take the same one. 
Um, so when you're studying for boards, you have to be an expert in all areas of genetic counseling, not just what you maybe have a job in. And then even now, if I wanted to change from peds to cancer, I could. Um, it'd be a big transition for me having to suddenly go back to that, but it is definitely a possibility. So you don't have to declare. It's not like undergrad. Yeah, yeah. good answer. Yeah. Laura, oh, calling wow. you out by name. After doing this job for so many years, do you still enjoy it? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yes, I love it. I mean, I, um, so my story is that I, again, after undergrad, I sold pharmaceuticals for five years and then um, was actually applying to medical schools and someone introduced me to genetic counseling. And so I said, oh, this sounds great knowing very little about what it actually was. And then I went to the program here, graduated in 1995, and then worked for, I don't know, 10 years or so until I had kids. And then I stayed home for 12 years or so, um, totally got out of the profession, and then decided, you know, I really love to do that again. Um, so I had to sit for my boards again, which I don't recommend for anybody. <laughs> um, but, you know, and at that point, there were several jobs available in Pittsburgh. Uh, one of them was a cancer job, there was this pediatric job, and I just was really drawn to the pediatric component, and I just love it. I love to come to work every day. Um, I enjoy my colleagues, I enjoy the job, I love working at Children's. So yes, I can say with just 100%, I still love my job, because again, it's so different, and as technology and knowledge changes, I mean, even people who've been doing it longer than me, you're, you're saying new things, right? Because the technology changes, so you're explaining a new test, or we have new information about a particular genetic disorder. So it's just always evolving, and so I think that that is one of the things that makes it a job that you can do for many, many years and still love it and still feel like it's, you know, you're not doing the same old thing day after day. So yeah, 100%, love it. Uh, how many hours do you work a week? So we touched on that a little bit. Technically full time is like 37 and a half, 40 hours per week. There's a good chance you might do more than that, uh, depending on I mean, the week, what you have going on, prepping for patients, results disclosures coming back. Um, I would say 100% this is not a 40 hour a week job. <laughs> so you get paid for 40 hours a week. Um, but it is, I mean, there are some weeks where we were working, you know, 60 hours a week easily. Uh, other weeks where it's a little more, it's a little slower, a little more typical, but there is, I mean, I will say that you're kind of never caught up. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a lot of hours, but in terms of, you know, again, it's enjoy, they're enjoyable hours for the most part. So even if you're prepping cases at home on the weekend, I still enjoy prepping cases, and I've been doing it now, what, for five years, you know, recently, and um, it just, again, it's why you really need to have a passion for the job, um, so it is, it's not a, you know, check your time card when you come in, and check your time card when you come out, it is not that kind of job, for sure. So. And I will say different positions have gotten better at trying to respect, like, a work-life balance, or making sure that we don't get burnt out, um, you know, different departments realize that, because there is such a demand for genetic counselors, if we truly hate the system here, we have the option to go to a different hospital and a different institution. Mm -hmm. So keeping in mind that hospitals do want to retain genetic counselors, trying to maybe decrease the number of patients that you see per week, so that way you do have more time that you're not working 80 hour weeks, you know, things like that. So when applying for jobs, really trying to fit with the coworkers that you have and seeing, you know, how well does the institution take care of you as far as expectations and what are the expected timelines for getting results back to families or you know, kind of different protocols in place, trying to, as best we can, respect that work-life balance while still getting the job done, while knowing that you're never gonna have everything completed. And even as a new GC, it really hasn't been that bad. Of course, I definitely do some prepping on the weekends and work from home, but it's definitely doable, especially if you have good coworkers and an institution that supports you as well. So everything that Emily and Laura said is really helpful as a new genetic counselor, I feel like. Next step till 2.30. I think we have until 3. Okay, great. Um, so the next question is, how can I learn more as a high school, high school student? Like I said, I think the NSGC website, mm -hmm. trying to reach out to genetic counselors. Um, if you can, you know, put like a Google alert out for genetic counseling, genetics, reading any of those books that were on the resources slide, just mm -hmm. being, you know, you want to become a genetic counselor because you're passionate about it, so just finding that information out. 
um, individuals who are on Reddit, there is a genetic counseling subreddit, so you can join that to talk with other people who are applying. That can be a way to kind of reach out to talk to other individuals who might be in a similar situation as well. Yeah, those are most of the resources. Um, foreshadowing, is that a long-term arrangement or more of a once or twice kind of thing? For us, it's more of a once or twice kind of thing. There may be some institutions that have it on a more regular basis, but it's usually we see you once when we are allowing it in person, it's usually an all day thing where you're here from eight to five to truly shadow all day in clinic. So hopefully you can see eight patients, depending on if any no show or cancel their appointment the day of. Um, but then that way, you know, if you can see eight, that gives you a nice variety in a day. What made you choose a clinical position versus a commercial position with a genetics company? Yeah, so it's a really good question. I think maybe I can tackle that one because I've actually done both. Um, and I think that um, part of it is just personality, right? So there are some genetic counselors who prefer sort of the more clinical side of things, right? So writing reports or interpreting uh, results and sort of the, the really nitty gritty basic molecular genetics of things. Um, and so sometimes a commercial, like a position with a commercial lab is more, is a better fit for that type of person. Um, I think that typically genetic counselors probably go first with a clinical position uh, and then evolve into a commercial position, you know, position with a commercial lab or, a, you know, some sort of industry job. Um, partly because it helps you be better at that ind industry job, having had some practical experience. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just, again, I think it's a lot of personality. It's just what you enjoy doing because they're, they're quite different jobs. Um, so, yep. I have nothing to add. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can GCs find work abroad? Good question. Most, most definitely. I can tell you that even one of our genetic counselors who we work with, Leslie Walsh, Pitt offers you the opportunity to do an optional rotation. And so, like I said, I did my own lysosomal storage disorder. She actually did hers over in the UK, I believe in London. And so she worked with genetic counselors over there. And then one of my classmates went to Australia as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's definitely genetic counselors across the world. I think it's a matter of, you know, who do you know and, and where can you get linked up? Um, but it's definitely just not opportunities here. And of course, in Canada as well, mm -hmm. there's genetic counseling programs. Yeah. I'd say the only thing for abroad is making sure that different countries may have different rules as far as board certification. So if you take it in the States, making sure that that applies there where you may have to take that, like their version of that exam again. So just keeping in mind the different requirements, but definitely can be done. Laura mentioned having to sit for boards again. Is the certification, their certification renewal or continuing education requirements for GCs? <laughs> yes, so uh, the sitting for the boards again was because I was not very smart. And when I, when I stopped working and, and raised a family, I did not think I would ever go back to genetic counseling. So I just let my certification lapse. And that's why I had to sit for the boards again. Um, typically, it is a continuing, if you pass your boards the first time, then you maintain that board certification through continuing education continuing education. So you shouldn't have to sit for the boards again. Uh, I just wasn't very <laughs> smart about it. So yeah, it's continuing education. Yes, your board certification is valid for five years. And throughout that time, you just need to continue in education and then reapply, let it lapse. Mm -hmm. You get to sit for it again. And it's a four hour exam. So mm -hmm. I don't recommend doing that. Nope. <laughs> about $800. <laughs> Has technology drastically changed the field from what you have experienced so far? I'll defer to Laura because uh, I've only been in this a couple of years ago. <laughs> so back in the day, uh, <laughs> we, yeah, it was a very, very different. First of all, our volume was very different. Um, you know, we didn't see nearly the number of people, uh, patients that we do now. Um, now we have the internet at our disposal. Back then, I would go over to the medical library at Pitt and pull out big volumes and photocopy them on a photocopy machine with a little card or with orders um, to copy articles to learn about a particular condition or uh, etc. So um, not only that, back in the day, um, typically genetic testing was sort of one gene at a time, right? So if we were concerned for a connective tissue disorder, you know, you'd start with, okay, let's do the Marfan gene. Nope, that was negative. Okay, next we're going to do the Lois Dietz gene. Nope, that was negative too. Let's go up 
So it's a very long drawn out process. Now technology in terms of genetic testing has changed so much that we can do all that basically at one time. Um, you can easily research things and have access to worldwide databases in terms of you know, what a particular variant might mean or you know, the medical literature, um, finding obscure information about obscure disorders, it's all sort of at your fingertips. So, so uh, it has changed immensely. And you know, even the tests that we can offer and the complexity of them changes the genetic counseling that goes in, that is involved as well. So um, yeah. <laughs> That's a, it has definitely changed and continues to change. You know, right now our biggest test that we offer, our biggest test, so to speak, is called an exome. Um, but right around the corner is going to be genome sequencing, and so we're going to have to adapt our genetic counseling process to, you know, in the probably the near future, offering whole genome sequencing. So it's always evolving, uh, 100%. I mean, we've seen patients I have for follow-up where I might not have seen them initially five years ago when they came in, but since that time has passed, we now have a new test. We're able to offer them new things, and now we find a diagnosis that because technology has improved, we just wouldn't have found five years ago. So right. even in as little a time as that, we've made improvements, we've found new genetic you know, disorders, things are, we're still continuing to learn so much in this profession. Mm -hmm. And from a service delivery model perspective, you know, mm -hmm. Laura works with our telemedicine clinic here, and a lot of us are doing telemedicine now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And so maybe one of the things you can think about when you're going to a program is if you're interested and if that's part of their training, I know personally it was part of my training, and so it was nice to have that experience, especially now being behind the camera, um, because from a telemedicine perspective, there are different counseling techniques that you need to employ and different challenges that come with that. So mm -hmm. it's definitely changing the way that we connect with our patients as well. Yeah, absolutely. Were you able to work full-time and go to school, or did you go to school full-time? I went to school full time, but I had a part time job that was 10 hours a week put on through my program as part of the financial aid. Um, you are there to be a student. So, some programs, I think that's why I mentioned John Hopkins might have been a longer one where if it is something to do part time, but I believe most of them are full time yeah. as a student, but offering part time jobs. Right. Ashley being the GCA for us while well, she was also in school. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a full time, it's not like a part time master's program, it's full time. A lot of people do work, but um, typically it's just, you know, definitely a part-time job. Oftentimes it relates to genetics somehow or their thesis or uh, my, I worked as well, but it was also my thesis project and it was like paid my tuition and, you know, sort of a, an internal thing. So I'm not sure it would be feasible or recommended to have a full-time job and then do this like on the side. I don't even think that's really an option to be honest, but, but you could ask at the individual programs for sure. What kind of opportunities they might have for that balance. Yeah. My position was part-time as well, so it was definitely helpful to have a job that was flexible and understood the position that I was in as a student. I know when I talked with a lot of programs, that was one of my questions was, do, or do your students work? And some of the answers were no. And so I think, again, just an important question when you guys hopefully are going on your interviews to explore, um, just based on your own needs, for sure. Mm -hmm. I think finding a program that's flexible, when I was in grad school, one of the my classmates in the grade above me was pregnant right at the tail end of her second year. She had her baby in what should have been the final semester. Obviously, you had a baby that's going to interfere with your timeline. And so our program was quite flexible. She was done with her classes, but she still needed to complete her clinical rotation in her thesis. And so they worked with her to come up with a schedule where she was still able to take some time off to be at home with a newborn and then also to still return. And so she was able to graduate just a semester later. So she had a, a late summer graduation instead. So mm -hmm. not something recommended throughout the entirety of your education. But if you know things come up, talk with your program directors about working out a, a solution for everyone. Mm -hmm. Is the path to becoming an industry genetic counselor similar to becoming a clinical counselor? So I think that um, when we say industry genetic counselor, you are functioning as a genetic counselor. So you have a master's, you typically would be board certified, uh, and you're just doing a different type of job. So you know when you're when you're thinking about the definition of a genetic counselor, you still have gone through the program, you're board certified. Uh, it's just that you are not working for an academic or you know medical facility. You're working 
for typically a genetic testing lab. Um, so it's the same process because you are starting out as a board certified genetic counselor. It's just what you choose to do with that training uh, that is different. So yes. Does the field have any sort of epigenetics test? Is epigenetics considered at all, or is it still too small of a field? I'm happy to take that one as well. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, epigenetics is a challenge. Um, we don't, I mean, when you think about epigenetics, you know, you're thinking about sort of, does the, you know, the stress the grandmother who was pregnant with our patient's mother somehow impact our patient, right? So that's one level of epigenetics. Um, epigenetics can also be methylation, right? So in some ways, epigenetics is part of the testing that we do, but I think the way you're thinking of epigenetic, um, it's not even that it's too small of a field, it's just that it's um, almost like an imprecise field in terms of the testing that we would offer clinically. So it, it's not something that we sort of do a whole lot of. I think I'll just, I mean, that would be my sort yeah. of comment or thought yeah. process on that. So. I agree. See epigenetic conditions such as like Prader Willi, mm -hmm. Angelman, things that are methylation that we can test for. But as far as you know, grandmother stress during pregnancy, mm -hmm. that, that's challenging for us to try to do in a, a yeah. clinical setting. Right. All right. And then I believe that was the last question. All right. So thank you all for joining yeah, us. Yeah, thank yeah, you thank so you. much. We hope it was helpful. Um there is this is going to be recorded, and so it should be available in a couple of days um, on the CDTR. Okay. Yep, on the rare disease sure. website. So I believe you should be sent a link in the email afterwards, or you can access that website through some of the emails that you received before when you registered. And there should be a recording of this as well so that you can reference that as you need. Uh -huh. Excellent. Thank you all. Have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>